The Soviet Union is without contest history's largest, most dominant communistic force to ever raise its flag on this earth. An empire of communism which sowed the seeds of an uprising all across Asia, which, in the span of only a few decades, accelerated the development of Russia and its client states from a second-class European nation to a world-class civilization. One capable of rivaling Britain, Germany, and the US. Russia, a country which at one point could hardly muster an armored division, was now constructing on mass planes, guns, and tanks at speeds even the US had to compete with. And speaking of tanks, today's video is sponsored by War Thunder, a realistic, free-of-play online game where you can play as more than 1,200 different aircraft, tanks, and ships from the USSR, Germany, UK, Japan, Italy, France, China, and more. Spanning from the Spanish Civil War era to the Cold War, where you can play on historic maps like the Battle of Stalingrad or alternate history maps like the invasion of Britain and Operation Sea Lion. If you're already interested, follow our exclusive link in the description below and sign up to receive a free premium tank or aircraft and three days of premium membership. Now, back to the video. The USSR came to form in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution and subsequent Russian Civil War, a conflict which in the wake of Tsar Nicholas' abdication would determine the future of the nation and shape both its body and spirit for the foreseeable future. The Russian Civil War was fought by the Bolshevik Reds and Imperial Whites, with various other groups in the mix supporting one of the larger factions. In addition to efforts made by the European and Japanese empires to quash the communist uprising which had gone too far. Due to a lack of cooperation and access to the industrial sectors of Russia, the White Army gradually fractured before finally breaking apart in the wake of leader Admiral Kolchak's capture, leaving only fringe factions of the White Army to be hunted down and annihilated by the Bolsheviks, who later asserted dominance over rival left-wing factions in the Ukraine and Far East. Lenin, the leader of the Bolshevik party and would-be leader of the USSR, was shot and saw his health deteriorate drastically. Leon Trotsky, his general during the Civil War, was to be his successor, but quickly building a legion behind him was Joseph Stalin, who defamed Trotsky as a radical and a traitor to the party, who could not be trusted to carry forward the will of the Russian worker. Lenin was unable to make public his selection of Trotsky and concerns over Stalin's agenda before his death, but when the time came, Stalin had managed to outcompete the various parties vying for the seat of power and reach the position of undisputed leader, expelling his rivals Hirsch Applebaum and Leon Trotsky, doing away with Lenin and Trotsky's ideal of international communism and replacing it with an ideal of socialism in one country. Because why would you try to spread the revolution to the rest of the world when the rest of the world wants to kill you? Stalin would begin a program of intense industrialization and land collectivization, something which would eventually make the USSR a production powerhouse, but at the cost of tremendous trial and error, faced by millions who would have to undergo starvation and brutality at the hands of the state. There was this idea, or rather a fear, of the West outcompeting Russia, and now, as the USSR, that extended to the West attacking and annihilating the Soviet Union. Thus, tremendous effort was funneled into creating more industry, in developing stronger weapons, in creating a bigger army. Again, trial and error at work, but eventually it did get somewhere, as the Soviet Union managed to plow through Europe and dominate half the continent, although Europe was already in a far weakened state because of the Second World War. But anyhow, the Cold War happens, the US and USSR build bigger, more dangerous nukes, the two begin waging proxy wars and become rivals for half a century. The USSR begins becoming disillusioned with communism, as while development kept rising, the people's standard of living didn't seem to improve. The Soviet government was spending more than it could produce, and it became clear that the West was becoming a land of plenty. The republics which made up the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics were starting to desire greater sovereignty to perhaps eat at the Western table, or at least not remain with the scraps of the Soviet Union. Under Mikhail Gorbachev, the USSR's last leader, the one-party rule of the communist government was abolished, a restructuring of the state's economy began, and the doors were open for debate, criticism, and freer speech. This was known as perestroika and glasnost, respectively. This openness and release of the people from the grip of the communists led Russia and many of the other republics to begin contemplating leaving the Union. Even the Soviet parliament would be replaced by a congress elected by the people. With the totalitarian grip of the Soviets finally abolished and the people disillusioned with communism after living in continued poverty and fear of censorship or government violence, the USSR could no longer carry on. Gorbachev understood drastic reform was needed and set forward plans to create a new Soviet Union with a hybridized economy of capitalist and communist elements, 
a new means for the republics to govern themselves by establishing the Union of Soviet Sovereign Republics in place of the USSR, and decentralize the country into a democratic confederation. However, before this plan could be put through, the very day prior, the 1991 Soviet coup was launched by a group of hardline communists in an attempt to remove Gorbachev from power and prevent what was being perceived as the destruction of the Soviet Union. They were met with civil resistance led by President of the Russian SSR Boris Yeltsin, and the coup was averted. Moldova, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were recognized as independent, and one by one, republics left the Union, leaving only Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan remaining. On the 8th of December, Boris Yeltsin signed the accords which officially declared that the USSR had ceased to exist. Two weeks later, Gorbachev officially resigned as Soviet president. And that's where it ends for most people. The US wins, Russia is restored, and we get two glorious decades of Commander Putin. Is that really the whole story? What if I told you that in those years following the fall of the USSR, in a set of events almost mirroring 1917, civil war almost broke out in Russia in a seldom spoken event known as the Russian Constitutional Crisis, or Black October. Let's set the scene. The year is 1993, and President of Russia Boris Yeltsin is facing resounding criticism as prices have skyrocketed and hefty taxes break the backs of Russia's already struggling population. Industries are shut down, Russia is facing down a depression, Russian territories are pondering secession, and Yeltsin's vice president has declared no confidence in Yeltsin's leadership. To top it all off, Yeltsin was also stretching the limits of his presidential powers and was butting heads with the still existing Supreme Soviet and Congress of People's Deputies. A new constitution that would grant Yeltsin greater power was declined by the Congress and Supreme Soviet, leading him to declare on national television that he would be assuming extraordinary executive power to combat the parliament which he accused of attempting to restore the Soviet order. Something which in all fairness wasn't too extreme a claim as the majority of Congress united against Yeltsin consisted of the Communists of Russia Party, the Agrarian Union, Industrial Union, Workers Union, Russian All People's Party, and more. This alliance of both nationalist and communist parties was known as the Russian Unity Bloc and dwarfed Yeltsin's democratic liberal supporters. A referendum would determine that Yeltsin had the support of the public by a slim margin averaging about 55% but not the parliament. This slim victory, which had saved Yeltsin from potential resignation, would motivate countless anti-government protests headed by deputies of the Supreme Soviet, proclaiming that the Congress of People's Deputies was the supreme lawmaking body and would alone decide on the new constitution. The Congress began taking legal actions differing from Yeltsin's, from confirming leadership of Russian territories and furthering further policies of its own, while launching investigations on Yeltsin's advisors to pin them on corruption. On September 21st, Yeltsin declared the dissolution of the Supreme Soviet, an act which was unconstitutional and which the Constitution declared would cease his presidential powers immediately. Thus, Congress declared that Yeltsin is impeached as president. Russia was now without a president or Congress. These actions sparked anger on both sides, leading tens of thousands of Russians to march upon the streets of Moscow, but the calls against Yeltsin were by far the loudest that he was corrupt, that the violent crime had hit an all-time high, that life expectancy was falling, and that it was all his fault. Yeltsin sicked his special police forces on the protesters, leading to mass violence on the streets of Moscow, while at the same time word had reached Yeltsin that the parliament building built an army of 600 men with a sizable cache of arms. This really happened, people! The Russian church attempted to mediate peace, but violence on the streets of Moscow militarized. Barricades were built around the parliament, streets were blocked, and even small numbers of military came out to lend aid to the anti-Yeltsin forces. Yeltsin's vice president, Alexander Rutskoy, organized parliamentary supporters into battalions and demanded they seize governing offices and broadcasting centers to be followed by a storming of the Kremlin and imprisoning of Yeltsin. Yeltsin's few supporters, reinforced by the special police and military, prepared to storm the parliament, but Rutskoy was for military and appealed to many of the soldiers, who themselves had little sympathy for Yeltsin, but were... Hot damn, we're never gonna get into this scenario. Alright, let's speed things up. The soldiers were torn on who to support, but ultimately for some uncertain reason backed Yeltsin. The parliament was stormed and the Supreme Soviet abolished. Yeltsin consolidated power and outlawed all communist and nationalist parties, fronts, associations, clans, communes, etc. Creating, in essence, a neoliberal dictatorship, appointing new prime ministers, military leaders, and security councils without the need of congressional approval from the newly established Duma, which new elections were held for and even allowed the president to bypass the constitution without facing impeachment. Wow, what a crazy story. And that is where I'm going to end today's scenario. Jeez, I didn't even do the scenario yet. 
All right. But what if all that changed? What if Rutskoy had managed to turn the Russian military against Yeltsin in that moment which could have changed the history of Russia forever? Well, to put it simply, Yeltsin would have been ousted from power, unlikely to flee, he'd be imprisoned, and the Supreme Soviet would take power with Alexander Rutskoy at its head. This regime change may present the opportunity for a secession of the republics within Russia, most probably the Komi Republic, which would have access to sizable Russian oil reserves, and, if it's able to defend itself, could become a long-standing trade partner, living in symbiosis with Russia, selling its oil to further develop and industrialize itself. Rutskoy's own ideology was one of nationalist populism, something he'd try to channel into a political party in our timeline following his release from prison, but one which subsequently failed in our timeline. Things this time around are much different. Rutskoy employs a Russian-first strategy to restore the Russian economy and create new jobs by nationalizing failing industries and reviving them with government funding. With the balance of communist and nationalist ideals in parliament, we'd see a steady return to socialism in one country, once again with much trial and error. It'd be a risky move, but something had to be done. The people were hungry and desperate, the nation was in a tailspin, and this might be the last chance to restart the engine, or the Soviet Union won't be the last thing to break up. The state would sponsor projects to construct new infrastructure to create new jobs, while buying out failed businesses and blighted homes to circulate money back into the citizens, while creating newly nationalized businesses and housing, many of these businesses being geared toward engineering and production of new goods to be exported. In essence, the sweatshop system, but slightly more pleasant than what they have in China. It'd be a grueling period, but eventually it would dig Russia out of its slump. National and workers' pride would be enforced at every avenue to keep morale high as the nation quietly rebuilt itself. This is Russia's identity. Russia has always faced the task of needing to catch up with the rest of the Western world, and when it finally comes close, it's always knocked back down. But that has never stopped it from getting back up because the Russian spirit cannot be broken, and once again, Russia must stand back up. But this time, they will remain unconfrontational. Socialism in one country means socialism in one country. Moves will certainly be made to reincorporate useful and ancestral lands back into the Russian Socialist Republic, but only insofar that it not violate alliances with foreign powers and draw Russia into another war. This means no to the Baltic states, though perhaps parts of the Caucasus and, well, the Ukraine, and perhaps Kazakhstan along with the Komi Republic, who really wouldn't be able to resist the force of a remilitarized Russia. To prevent ideologies swaying one direction or another, a variant of the National Bolshevism Party will become the national political party of this new Russia, and the uniting ideology of the Supreme Soviet. This version of the ideology would be more akin to a reformed Stalinism, this Russia wouldn't be perceived as the same boogeyman it is today, as its withdrawal from alliances with Syria to focus on itself, and lack of belligerence with the West leave it out of sight and out of mind, much like Vietnam, China, and less so North Korea. Censorship, while still implemented, would not be needed to so high a degree, as the Russians by this point have accepted the path laid out for them, and simply take greater pride in the culture and ideologies of their own nation over those of the West though the government would still deter foreign businesses from setting up shop in the RSR, ensuring that foreign economic policy draws money in, but not out. This leaves Russia in a situation akin to that of the US pre-World War I, an isolationist nation focused on itself and only extending its influence to the immediate vicinity, and only when most convenient. Its massive nuclear arsenal and slowly but steadily growing economy could poise it to once again become a superpower in the future, so long as it keeps to itself, but, who's to say that wouldn't just be Russia's history repeating itself yet again? Once again, I'd like to thank War Thunder for helping make today's video possible, as well as all of you who signed up. The game's extremely versatile in that you could play it with casual settings or more realistic physics and damage, as well as the different ways you could play on land, sea, or air with an assortment of over 1,200 historically accurate tanks, aircrafts, and ships. Sign up and join us to play with millions of others from all over the world on PC, PS4, and Xbox One, but be sure to use our link in the description to both keep the channel prosperous and earn yourself a free premium tank or aircraft, plus a 3-day premium membership absolutely free. And as always, the US of Z thanks for watching. Support your legion by liking the video or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.